I think most Americans are pretty independent-minded. Most Americans have very uh, libertarian or classical liberal tendencies. And so uh, I think they can relate to my frustrations working within the party system and why I'd want to leave that, uh, that system. When Michigan Representative Justin Amash declared his independence from the Republican Party on July 4th, he instantly became one of the most controversial politicians in America. Donald Trump immediately took to Twitter to denounce Amash, calling him a total loser and one of the dumbest and most disloyal members of Congress. But whether you agree with the five-term congressman's choice to leave the Republican Party, he's anything but dumb and unprincipled. Amash has been the most consistently libertarian member of Congress since taking office in 2011. He's repeatedly voted to reduce the size and spending of the federal government, to stop mass surveillance of American citizens, and to end overseas wars he believes lack constitutional authorization. I spoke with Amash, the son of Middle Eastern immigrants, at Freedom Fest, the annual gathering of libertarians in Las Vegas. We talked about what it feels like to be an independent, why he won't be joining Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's social justice squad anytime soon, whether he thinks Donald Trump is actually racist, if he's going to run for president as a libertarian, and why he believes we need to talk more about love in national politics. Justin Amash, thanks for talking to Reason. Thanks so much, Nick. What's it feel like to be independent now? It feels good. I'm happy. Uh, I have uh, better relationships with a lot of my colleagues, frankly, because there's not the same pressure to fall in line with a party. And um, I've been thinking about this for years and really have, have found myself unhappy uh, a lot of the time in Congress because you feel like you're spinning your wheels, you're trying to make things work, you're trying to improve the system, and uh, you find that you're going nowhere. And my colleagues who are also trying are also mm -hmm. going nowhere. So it's, you know, it's, a, it's a relief and it's, it's nice to be uh, happy and free and, and representing my constituents. Do, do you feel like you can speak, I mean, you, you can speak more freely so you're not contorting yourself? Yeah, you know, as much as people think, well, Justin's already very independent. He was an independent Republican, he spoke his mind. And I got that from a lot of uh, my family members mm -hmm. too and others. Hey, you know, if you stay a Republican, you can still speak your mind and, and do whatever you, you like. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people don't realize the amount of pressure we face every day to fall in line with the party. Mm -hmm. So even those of us who are very independent are facing pressure from our friends and colleagues. And um, it's, it's like, uh, you know, pressure from essentially friends, you know, like, do you want to upset the people you work with every day? Uh, you have to see them every day. You go into work. Mm -hmm you are uh, at meetings together, do you really want to upset them day after day? And, and that, that takes a toll on people. And uh, my colleagues, you know, they don't want to uh, be independent. They want to just keep doing the same thing and, and they can survive in the system, but it's not my kind of thing. Obviously the, uh, the Mueller report and uh, kind of your reading of that and your attitude towards Trump was part of this process, but other things. What was the big split ultimately between the GOP's vision of America and your vision of America where you're like, okay, I'm, I'm done here? Well, it's not really the Mueller report or even Donald Trump. I, mm -hmm. I think Donald Trump is a symptom of the problem. And I've been thinking about uh, becoming an independent for quite a while. Um, I've talked about it in previous sessions of, of Congress, previous terms with my mm -hmm. colleagues. Um, I've talked to my family about it and friends about it. And um, it's just that we've gotten to the point where finally I came to the conclusion that this was not going to turn around for the party or for the two party system. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I wanna be clear, I'm obviously very familiar with the Republican party and, and how it works, but Democrats have the same problems internally. And the system itself is driving us toward what I call uh, this, this partisan death spiral mm -hmm. where um, I don't think we can escape from it, and, and everyone is just angry all the time and has such contempt for everyone else. And do you, I, do you see any other uh, members following you and becoming independent? Well, I hear from colleagues every day. In fact, after I became uh, independent, I went back to work the mm -hmm. next week, and I had several colleagues come up to me and ask me about the, the logistics of mm -hmm. it. Uh, can they you name said, names? Who, who did <laughs> I'm that? I'm not going to name okay. names. No, but... They asked me about the logistics of it and, and how you might go about doing it. And they've, they've felt this way for a long time too, that they mm -hmm. want to become independent. Um, I don't know whether any of them will ever do it, but I've talked to them and, and I've made the point that there needs to be a revolution in politics. Mm -hmm. it, one person doing it, great. 
I can go out and I can educate people and talk about the problems of the two-party system. But if we had three or four or 12 mm -hmm. or two dozen people doing it, then you have a revolution within the system. And then you can start mm -hmm. to really change things in a major way. So what, again, what is it about the GOP right now that you're just like, I'd rather be outside the party than inside? What is, is you know, what are the key issues? Well, there's, there are no principles other than uh, sticking with the leader of the party. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we talk about limited government, economic freedom, and individual liberty on the campaign trail, but when you go to Congress, none of that is a concern. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody follows the Constitution or cares about the Constitution. People talk about uh, spending, you know, they say, oh, we're spending too much money, but then they keep voting for more spending. Mm -hmm. So the Republican Party is not living up to the ideals mm -hmm. it talks about. They're, they talk about um, FISA, for example, in the context mm -hmm. of the Russia uh, situation, but then they'll vote for FISA reauthorization and the mm -hmm. president will sign it into law. So the president is using the same power that he's decrying all the time and that, that his supporters are decrying. So uh, I think that um, the, it's become uh, very much wrapped up around a personality and it mm -hmm. used to be wrapped up around other leaders. It might be the Speaker of the House if he's a Republican right. or, or someone else, but it gets wrapped up around a few figures who really control the whole system. Mm -hmm. and, and it's true on the Republican side and the Democratic side. What should Nancy Pelosi be doing differently as Speaker? She should be opening up the process. Mm -hmm. And this is something I said when Ryan was the Speaker mm -hmm. and when Boehner was the Speaker. And the most shocking thing that I've discovered is Boehner might have been the best Speaker mm -hmm. that I've served under. So. Um, and, and I'm sure somewhere he's high and drunk and he's like, oh, yeah, maybe Amash well, isn't so bad. You know, my friend Thomas Massey is yeah. frequently on uh, plane rides right. with him. And I said, hey, tell him that we want him back. <laughs> um, he's he, as, as much as yeah. I had problems with John Boehner and, and do yeah. have serious problems. Yeah. And, and I don't think he ran it in a very open way. Uh, he's been better than what we've seen from Ryan or from Pelosi. Mm -hmm. Th they have to open up the process. What I've said many times is the legislative process is supposed to be a process of discovery. Mm -hmm. we're, spo we're supposed to discover the will of the people through the process. Instead, they are deciding the outcomes ahead mm -hmm. of time. A few people get together, the Speaker of the House, the Senate Majority Leader, the President of the United States, they get together, they decide what outcome do they want, and then they go and try to uh, you know, twist arms and try to get, mm -hmm. get the votes they need. And that's not the process that the founders designed. Is Nancy Pelosi a particularly effective speaker? I mean, independent of your concerns or, or the content that she's pushing, but I is mean, she it, really good at what she does? It depends on what you mean by effective. Mm -hmm. I, I think that she does have a lot of control over her side. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that that's a good thing, that's, uh, but some people might view that as effective, that mm -hmm. she's, she's able to control a diverse uh, body of people. But as I said, I don't think that's the way Congress mm -hmm. is supposed to work. She's supposed to look out for the institution first, not just her uh, political power mm -hmm. and, and uh, perpetuating that power. Do you have a speaker historically who you think was the best speaker? Uh, no, I, I, I'm too young to like, oh. think about speakers yeah, from long Like ago. a millennial or something. So yeah, <laughs> screw history, right? What about... Um, oh, I, I remember like back to Gingrich and that's okay, about it. Yeah. And, uh, and I think he is one of the people who actually started this process yeah. of really centralizing power. I, I suspect that he is not getting as much credit as he would want, but he's really when politics kind of started to become what they have become. Yeah, I think so. I I think that um, the system we have today, the, the way the speaker works today is very much in the mold of Newt Gingrich. And, mm -hmm. um, and he seems to have moved us uh, more strongly in that direction than yeah. previous speakers. Do you see yourself particularly now that you're an independent, will you be working with either the Freedom Caucus, which you resigned from, uh, but also like uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her squad? I mean, are you going to become the first male member of the Spice no, Girls not, or I'm something? I'm not joining but, the squad. But, okay. But no, uh, but um, uh, is there, is there uh, room there to work with somebody like AOC? There's room to work for, with everyone. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've always uh, held that view that I should be able to work with every single person in Congress, regardless of their uh, political philosophy mm -hmm. or political party. Um, you're not going to agree with everyone on everything, obviously. I don't agree with you know my closest colleagues on everything. Mm -hmm. uh, Thomas Massey and I could have big disagreements on some issues. Mm -hmm. um, we're not voting alike on every single issue. So you know, I, I look at where we have common ground and, um, you know, if AOC has 20% common ground with me on something, um, I'm going to work with mm -hmm. her on that issue. And, and similar, similarly with the Freedom Caucus, 
uh, maybe I'll agree with 50 or 60 percent of what they're mm -hmm. doing and we'll work on those things together. Do you worry about the, the rise of so-called democratic socialists and, and kind of what AOC and her squad represent? I mean, it's, it's a pretty frontal attack on the things that you care about. Um, do you think they're growing in power or, or is this kind of they're their own kind of wilderness beast? You know, I think that they have some influence um, and I think they are uh, effective at getting their message out there. Mm -hmm. uh, I would I would say that they are really a reaction to Donald Trump. And for Republicans who are worried about socialism and uh, worried about big government, and, mm -hmm. and there are still a few Republicans who are worried about big government, um, I think that the rise of Donald Trump has really helped uh, lift uh, these types of members of Congress up, mm -hmm. the ones who are pushing for socialism. If you're worried about socialism, then you have to worry about the reaction that uh, the general public has to Donald mm -hmm. Trump. Because I think when they see uh, the kinds of things he's saying and when he gets them so angry, when he creates mm -hmm. such a, um, a level of discord and contempt, and I'm not saying the other side is pure. Right. You know, they, they do lots of things um, at times to rile people up and, and be nasty to other people as well. But Donald Trump is the president of the United States. He's at the top. Uh, he shouldn't be punching down. He should be setting an example for everyone. And when he doesn't set the right example, um, I think you shouldn't be surprised that you're going to have some kind of socialist uh, pushback and that people might turn to things like socialism. The other thing I would say is if you create an environment of contempt like the president is uh, at least uh, facilitating, you know, I'm not going to say he started it, but, right. but he's definitely putting... Uh, fuel into the fire. If you have that environment of contempt, liberty cannot survive in that environment. Liberty requires a level of trust and societal cohesion where mm -hmm. people are willing to work with each other and respect each other and love each other. Uh, if you have a society where everyone's angry, they're definitely mm -hmm. going to turn to government. As the um, child of immigrants, how, how, did you were, how did you feel when Trump said to you know various members of Congress mistakenly thinking they were immigrants themselves mm -hmm. that they should go back to their to their own country I mean how, how did you respond well as to that? I said I, I think that's racist I think you it's um, offensive to a lot of people um, I'm a person who uh, faces that kind of discrimination on social media for sure mm -hmm. day after day I, I have so many examples of that uh, being told to go back to your country or go back where you came from. Mm. Um, and I think that there are many people out there, including many of my colleagues mm -hmm. who I talk to this, uh, talk about this issue to, uh, to them, they don't relate to it. You know, they haven't experienced it in the mm -hmm. same way, so they don't quite understand it. And, um, and those of us who come from families, uh, where we've had recent immigrants in the family, mm -hmm. like my parents are immigrants, I, I think we experience it a lot more and we, we can see that it's intended as uh, a type of racial slur, um, you know, your kind aren't welcome here. Could you talk a little bit more about your vision of America? I mean, in, in general, I, you, you oftentimes you talk a lot about how you how Congress should work, et cetera. But what is what's your big picture for America um, that proceeds from your beliefs in limited government? Well, my my big picture is an America where people care about each other, where they respect each other, mm -hmm. where they trust each other. Um, you're always going to have, uh, you know, bad apples in the system. Mm -hmm. You're going to have people who commit crimes. You're going to have people who are hostile. But as a general matter, uh, I think what separates America from a lot of other countries, at least historically, is that the people tend to get along pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, we tend to trust each other. And, and I uh, noticed this growing up. You know, I took a few trips when I was younger, um, went to Europe, for example, uh, with my family and on a school trip. And you'd notice differences in the culture where there was a lot of um, distrust. Um, people did not uh, feel the same sense of uh, cohesion. Mm -hmm. And in America, look, uh, we have a place where we will have a bookstore and the books will be outside of the store. Mm -hmm. You know, they trust no one's going to walk by and, and snatch one of the books and, and take it home. And I think that uh, stems from our culture of liberty hmm. and uh, and when you are um, you know self-reliant when you re when you demand personal responsibility in your life mm -hmm. 
you tend to trust each other more, actually. When you put so much power in government's hands, you tend to become distrustful of people. Do you feel, um, do you feel then there's a kind of broader libertarian culture in America that is related? I mean, it's the place we get along because things are voluntary or people are only showing up because they want to? I think that um, just our culture from the very beginning, mm -hmm. from our, our foundation, was very much uh, a classical liberal um, uh, trusting sort of culture mm -hmm. where uh, people just work together in communities. There was very much of a, a community sentiment mm -hmm and work together to, to get things done on a voluntary basis. Um, you know, maybe it, it stemmed from, you know, our uh, opposition to the throne at the very beginning and, and just the sense of community, hey, we don't have a king ruling over us, we have to work together. You, as a people. You've mentioned that, um, you know, we're in a, a period and, you know, certainly Donald Trump reflects this and helps further it, but of animosity, anger, uh, mm -hmm. whatnot. Um, what, what can be done to kind of start pulling that back and recreating the, the world that you're talking about? I think it, it requires a lot of small steps um, and it requires different people to do different things depending on what their uh, position in life is. Uh, you know, I'm uh, in a position where I'm a member of Congress, I have a lot of influence. Uh, I feel the need to go out there and use that, uh, that influence that I have mm -hmm. to uh, spread the message of love, uh, spread the message of liberty, mm -hmm. uh, talk about working together and respecting each other, and uh, how a lot of our problems can be solved voluntarily. We don't need government to control mm -hmm. everything and decide everything for us. And then when we talk about government, we can also talk about different levels of government that do things. You know, a lot of people say, well, either government will do it or the private sector. And I like to point out, look, there are different levels of government too. Some things might happen at the federal mm -hmm. level. Some things might happen at the state level. Some things might happen locally. Some things might happen in your family. They're all mm -hmm sorts of government. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, when you get closer to home, it's, it's like a, more like a private action. And, and so um, recasting it that way, getting people to understand uh, what creates a, you know, a smoothly operating society mm -hmm. is important to me. What, how have your constituents responded? Um, are they happy with you? Do they feel cheated because they elected you as a Republican? What, what kind of feedback have you been getting? It's been overwhelmingly positive. Mm -hmm. Now, there are definitely people who are upset. There are definitely mm -hmm. people who are diehard Trump supporters um, or very much, you know, uh, diehard party loyalists mm -hmm. who, who don't like it. But overall, the reception has been very positive. And uh, I think most Americans are pretty independent minded. Most Americans have very uh, libertarian or classical liberal tendencies. And so uh, I think they can relate to my frustrations working within the party system mm -hmm. and why I'd want to leave that, uh, that system. Did you talk directly with your constituents about this beforehand or how, how, did, you inter how did you manage that kind well, of communication? The important thing to know about my district is that for years I've been a very independent minded congressman. Uh, people know that I don't toe the party line. People know that when I run for office, I'm running uh, as an independent, uh, principled person. I tell them the set of principles I'm running on, and they know that I'm going to mm -hmm. follow those principles, even if it means going against my party. So um, nobody's surprised by that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And uh, I think just all the interactions I've had over the years, I've held many town halls. Mm -hmm. I've been very open with the community about where I stand, and I've listened to their concerns um, uh, it, it was pretty obvious to me that this is a community that will be supportive of mm -hmm. this kind of thing. Do you worry about being primaried? And, you know, I've seen some early polls showing that you, you, you know, you are going to have a real tough re-election battle. Yeah. So I'm running as an independent, so I won't be involved in the primary, but mm -hmm. I was never really worried about the primary. I mean, um, if I had stayed as a Republican, I would have won yeah. that primary. I think you have a bunch of people running who are going to run on the pro-Trump banner, mm -hmm. and you have one person who's saying, I'm going to stand up for the Constitution, yeah. I'm going to stand up for the people I represent. Um, I think when you break it down that way, it's easy to see yeah. how I come out on top. What about president? Uh, you've talked uh, in the past about possibly running for president on the LP, a Libertarian Party, whatever. What goes into that calculation, and where, where are you on that now? Well, I think what goes into the calculation is um, uh, deciding and thinking about where I can use my skills and my influence mm -hmm. best. Um, you know, I believe very strongly that we need independent minded members of Congress. I feel strongly about representing my community. I love my community. I, I love representing my community. Um, 
so if I can be most effective in that role, that's what I'll do. But I also think about um, you know, other roles. And that's why when people ask me, would you rule this out or rule that out? I don't tend to rule things out that way. Mm -hmm. um, it, it doesn't mean that I'm at a stage where I'm going to say, yeah, I'm going to do this for sure. Mm -hmm. Or I'm, you know, even 50% there. Mm -hmm. um, but I do like to uh, at least consider these things. I stay open-minded about them and think about how I can be most effective. And if I feel I can be effective uh, on the national stage, mm -hmm. uh, spreading the message of liberty and, and the message of uh, respect and love, then that's what I do. Do you have a campaign slogan yet? I, You're I obviously a, running, so it's a, you know, but do you no, have I a- I don't uh, have a campaign slogan, and, right. and I'm not obviously running. Okay. All right. Well, I think we'll leave it there. Thanks so much for talking with Reason. Thanks so much, Nick. For Reason, I'm Nick Gillespie.